So welcome everyone. This is another great webinar from the Instructional Design and Learning SIG, the IDL SIG. Um, today we've got Mr. Robert Hirschnall, and he's going to give us a talk about PowerPoint that he says, get a move on, and he's going to show us some fancy tricks with the animation, new, new tools and new tricks with animation. Um, Robert, as you may or may not know, is one of the co-managers of our SIG. Um, he's pretty much a Renaissance guy. He's got talent in um, technical documentation, also in instructional design. He's definitely a instructional video guru, especially in the audio part of it. But today he's going to show us yet another side of his cornucopia of skills. We're going to learn more about PowerPoint. So without further ado, Robert, if you're ready, sir. We're ready for you. Thanks so much, Vicki. Hi, everybody. Thanks for that great introduction. I'll try to, to live up to that. Um, as Vicki said, I'm co-manager of the Instructional Design and Learning Special Interest Group of the Society for Technical Communication, also known as the SDC IDLC. And that was completely gratuitous, but I wanted to show you this fabulous new effect. Actually, it's a transition called Morph in PowerPoint 2016. And we'll uh, take a closer look at that in a minute. I'm a longtime PowerPoint user since I don't even know when. I continue to love it because it just keeps getting better. That Morph effect that you just saw is a case in point. But I've offered, offered, also suffered through many corporate presentations, as I'm sure you have, that look like this or worse. And so I'm now a self-appointed evangelist for PowerPoint, and I'm here to tell you that there is hope and that there are better ways to use presentation programs, not just PowerPoint, but any of them. This webinar is about techniques, but it's also about concepts, and those are universal, even though the details may differ from one program to another. But I'm using PowerPoint, which is, of course, Microsoft's presentation software that allows you to create a slideshow and populate those slides with objects like pictures and shapes and text, and then animate all those things. And that's what we're going to talk about. Is everybody OK? Is the, is the audio OK? Looks like gaps displaying on the screen for somebody. Yeah, we, we have some things covering up your screen. Um, there's one in the middle of the top. At, yeah. So I think we want to minimize. Yeah, that that worked. Okay. And then there's one more at the top. Well, maybe it's this thing. It might be that thing. Well, how do I close this? Go away. <laughs> okay. So now we got the one. On. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thanks. Okay. Here we go. So, what are animations? What are we talking about here? In PowerPoint, they are visual effects. They don't necessarily have anything to do with motion, although most of them do. Um, but they're really about change. And they run the gamut from subtle, like fade, to maybe a little more exciting, like flash, to something silly, like bounce. And I hope you guys can see all these. Um, but we have to be careful, because there's a fine line between beauty and harassment. Um, as we've all seen, probably. Animations can be useful. They can be annoying. It just depends. But they fall into two categories, uh, two major types in PowerPoint. And the first, strangely enough, is called animations. And these apply to objects like text, pictures, and shapes. And the animations menu has four categories. Um, entrance effects bring an object onto the slide. And then emphasis effects can call attention to something. Exit effects take it out. We'll bring it back and take a look at motion path effects, which let you assign a path along which to move an object on the screen. And the other major type of animation is slide transition. And these are the things that happen between the slides. Transition categories are subtle. For example, the fade, and exciting, such as the airplane, and something called dynamic content, which I'll get into a little bit later, in which the objects change on the screen, but the background stays the same, which might not sound like a big deal, but it can save a lot of work, and it's pretty cool. We'll come back to look at all of these. 
So why would you use animations? Well, in the first place, they add interest. People love video. And animations are a lot like little videos. And they can show things that static pictures may not convey. Multisensory learning is more effective than still stuff. And, they, and it can actually increase uh, memory retention and aid in communication. Cognitive psychologist Richard Mayer observed that more elaborate presentations can actually increase information transfer and recall. If we make our brains work a little harder to get the point, it seems we remember it better. And this is one way we can do that. Also, animations entertain. Let's face it, they can be fun. And if you show somebody a good time, they'll be more likely to stick around and listen to you and come back for more. So when and where are they most useful? Well, where you want to provide emphasis or focus on something on the screen like this. Did everybody see that? It's a subtle. I blinked it a little bit. Maybe where you want to demonstrate something. If you want to demonstrate a process, you can use animations to do that. This is kind of simplistic, but you get the point. If you want to illustrate an idea, Animations can help with that. If you want to clarify something or differentiate between different items, a little fade animation to a different color here points out what you're talking about. If you need to wake up a sleepy audience, and slide transitions can cue your audience to get ready for changes in direction or changes in topic. I like to use a fade to black to visually put the current topic to bed and then introduce a new topic. And this can be very helpful in keeping everyone connected and it makes it helps make people happy. And if you do this a few times, it'll soon establish a pattern that people will recognize and they'll know what you're doing. So in short, use them where they have a purpose. It's very easy to do it. So keep them subtle except for special emphasis. Consider all the messages that you're sending, your narrative, your visual content, and your animations. And all those elements have to work together to send the same message in order to maximize the multisensory experience. The goal is to keep your audience engaged, of course, and involved and awake without going over the top and driving them crazy. Um, research says that the attention span of your audience is about 10 minutes. So a well-placed animation can help wake learners up. But don't wait 10 minutes, necessarily. Throughout the presentation, you can do little things, little animations, to maintain kind of an ongoing level of intrigue and involvement. Um, and there's, there's a sweet spot between enough and too much. Slide transitions are a special case, because there's a transition every time you show a new slide. So you've got an opportunity to do a wake-up thing, um, to set a direction, set a mood. And essentially, uh, each transition will be one of three things. The abrupt default is none, which can get people's attention, just like that. On the other hand, a fade is a little softer and more elegant. I use fades a lot uh, because they don't interrupt what I'm saying, and, and it just feels nicer. And then there are more dynamic effects, which um, work best in small amounts, something like this. So now here's a soft, elegant change of topic. How do we do this already? How do we animate something? I have a three-step process for applying animations. First, I select an effect. If I don't find the one I want, I make one. And we'll take a look at that in a minute, too. Next, I adjust the parameters and the options to meet my needs. And then I test it. Then usually I repeat steps two and three over and over again until I really do get what I want. So let's look at each of these in detail. There are many, many applications, animations to choose from. 
And at the bottom of this animation drop-down menu, where you see more entrance effects, you can choose more entrance, more emphasis, more exit. If you click that more entrance effects, you get um, you get 40 different things to choose from. All in all, there are 167 different choices in these menus. Plus, you can combine them to create even more possibilities. So obviously, some of these will be appropriate. Most will not. The only way to know is to go through them and try them out and see how they feel. This is the this is the work that you got to get out of the way. Like if you're going to play music, you got to learn how to play the guitar first, and that can be a real drag for a while until you get it. This is kind of a drag to go through all these, but it's kind of fun too. Until you know what they do, you don't know whether you can use them. Or not. But then you need to uh, consider things like your topic and your audience and the overall tone of your presentation and your purpose. What impression do you want to make? It's just like any other kind of communication. Audience analysis, subject analysis, all of that. For example, if you're pitching your startup to a group of investment bankers and you want to highlight an item on a list, would you do it like this? You might. Would you do it like this? You might, if the investment bankers were seven years old. Like that. So analyze the situation, research the options, and then choose. Vicki, you've raised your hand. Accidentally, I was trying to laugh. Hi, Vicki. <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> laughing. What impression do you want? I made the right impression there, didn't I? Yep. So to assign an animation effect to an object, you select the object on the screen, click on it, and then click on the desired effect in the animations menu. The animation will, or the, uh, the object will look like that. This is a text box that I've clicked on. And I can go up to the animations menu and click fade there or fly in or whatever I want to do. And it'll assign that. And then the next step is to set the parameters of that animation. While the default numbers might work fine, most of the time, for me, they don't because I'm picky. Um, so here's what you can do. You can change the timing, how long the thing lasts, how long it takes, when it comes in. Um, every effect, almost every effect, has some option that you can change or, or uh, choose from. And we'll look at some of those. But um, you kind of have to investigate those on your own, too. And then whatever triggers the the animation. Is it going to be a mouse click? Is it going to be automatic? You can actually even trigger it with other things in the slideshow, which we'll look at in a minute, too. Up in the upper right-hand corner of the toolbar is, is the timing toolbar. And um, in the middle of that is the start field. The default value is when clicked, which means clicking the mouse or the other controller. That's what clicks the, the animation or what triggers the animation. You can also choose with previous or after previous. And w what those mean is that it'll start either with whatever happened before, like whether it was a, the slide transition or a previous animation on the screen, like the previous line of text. You can, you can start things together or in sequence. It's really quite flexible, and it's pretty neat. Um, you can do all kinds of things that way. And then in the duration field, you can adjust the length of time that it takes to complete the animation. Um, you can set it to minutes or seconds. Um, and the number in the delay field down below that determines how much time passes between however you trigger the animation and the start of the animation. This is most helpful when you've got stuff going automatically and you want to wait two seconds or whatever to start something. Um, so with all these controls, you can completely customize the timing of each animation on the slide. Let's see if I can go back here. I got ahead of myself. You see animation pane highlighted here. This is a toggle switch. And if you hit that, it'll open the animation pane in the right-hand side. 
And this kind of gives you a graphical representation of all the animations on the slide. It's a timeline. It shows you uh, the order of them numbered, 0 and 1 there on the left. And it shows, the little clock shows you that 0 is automatic and 1 is triggered by the mouse. It shows you the length of each animation. You can click and drag and drop um, these animations, change the order, change the length of time. You can do all of this in the animation pane. If you hover over one of them, it will give you verbal information about that, when it comes on, what it is on the screen, and what triggers it. So this is a pretty powerful tool. And um, Oh, and if you click the Play All button up here in the left, in the top left, you can see a complete preview of all the animations on the slide in order without actually having to play the slide. Um, oh, this is how the animation pane looks in a busy slide. Lots more stuff there. So you can drag things around, like I said. Maybe you want one of these piles of bacon to come in at a different spot. You can just click on it and put it in a different place in that in that timing order. Very powerful tool. Um, let's see. Most effects, I think, offer options in the effects options drop-down. Not too many of them, but most of them have something. And then there's a dialog box that you can click if you expand that, that sometimes have even more. Here's what you can do with a fade assigned to a text box. You can fade as one object or all at once by paragraph. I don't really know the difference between those first two. I, I know the last one, which we've all seen, where each line of text comes up each time you click the mouse. So you can go through a, a list of things, bullet points. If you click that drop down, you can get this, um, this dialog box, which gives you a lot more uh, options to change things. Timing, um, you can attach sound effects, all kinds of things. Uh, let's see here. Oh, here's text animation. Just different ways to choose these and set, and set the timing. So it's kind of confusing because there's so many ways to do these different things, but once you get to know them, it's very flexible. You can jump into what you need to do from, from various places in your operation and various places on the screen. Now here's a different effect called spin, and these are the options that show up for spin. You can spin it in one direction or the other and spin it all the way around, or twice, or whatever. So the effects are different. Uh, effect options are different for different effects. Here's the dialog box for that spin effect, which gives you lots of flexibility in making things happen. Triggers are another really interesting thing. You can trigger an animation with, actually, with this one that we're looking at shows that it starts on the click of a rectangle on the screen. I'll show you this in a minute. I set up a, I put a little button on the screen. And you, when you click that button, it triggers the animation instead of triggering the transition to the next slide. But you can also trigger. Um, as with, with a, for example, a bookmark in a, in a multimedia file. If you've got a narration file playing, you can put a bookmark in that narration file, and when, you reach a cert, when that reaches a certain part of the narration, it triggers an animation. Great tool for, for e-learning. So lots of opportunity here for, for e-learning or whatever. Um, you know, click the right answer, get a reward kind of things. And you can have multiple triggers on the same slide or to trigger different responses, you know, the different inputs. Cool? Well, here's the, here's the button. Um, so you'll see the cursor. I think you can probably see my cursor. When I roll over this button, you can see that it's a live hyperlink. And if I click it, it triggers that animation. And if I'm really amused, I can just do this all day long. And it will stay on that same <laughs> slide until I so I move out and click outside of it, and then it advances the slide. Wow. <laughs> OK, very cool. So in that toolbar, 
under animation pane is a trigger. You click that, and then you can choose any item on the screen, any item in the slide to use as a trigger, or as I said, on a bookmark of a multimedia file. Pretty neat stuff. So then the final step is to test what you built and make sure it works. I recommend that you test pretty much constantly. Um, if you test every new animation and every change you make to an existing one, you'll know just where to look if something isn't right. If you've made 10 changes, then you might have to go back and dig through it, at least at the beginning, you know, until you get to know um, what you're doing. But but there are so many ways to change things. For me, I, I, I play it all the time. I test it all the time. And there are many ways to do this. It's easy to do. There are preview buttons and stuff all over the place. There's a preview. If you've got the animations tab open on the toolbar, there's a preview button on the left which will play the slide. In the animation pane, as I said before, you can play all of the animations, or you can select one of them, and it'll play from that point. So if you only want to look at a certain thing that you just did or, the, or a certain sequence, you don't have to sit through the whole thing. You can press Shift F5 on your keyboard to play the slide as it will look in the actual presentation. Or you can click the Play from the Slide icon, which is selected, highlighted here, if it's in your Quick Access toolbar. And I would advise putting that in there. I use this all day long when I'm building a PowerPoint presentation. I spend a lot of time testing, adjusting, and retesting until the timing fits the mood and my script. I also try to mark up my script so that I know when to click the mouse to advance the slide or animation in this particular script. Today, I apologize because I only got through page three. So at this point, I'm winging it. When I click here, I don't have any idea what's going to happen next. But there it is. Any questions? Is everybody okay? I don't. I, I'm not seeing the chat box. So maybe Vicky, you could clue me in if we have anything coming up. So so far, no questions. Krista does say that uh, your animations make her dizzy. I think that was the spinny thing. I hope it was just the spinny thing. Sorry, Krista. She's typing. <laughs> okay. So, I do have a Take question. A, yes, Vicki. So, um, and we'll wait. Well, other people are typing there, so while they're typing, I'll ask my question. Um, does animation add a lot to the file size? You know, that's a really good question. I haven't, um, I haven't analyzed it, and I didn't worry too much about this presentation because I didn't send it to you for upload. It's just running on my computer, <laughs> right. but but it is massive. And it's got a lot of slides. It's, there's like 150 slides in this, I think. Um, okay. So you had a so, question so there's too large, then. I would, yeah, it's going to add something. But, but that's right. a good thing, good thing to think of. I'll tell you that, um, well, I, I'll, I'll get into this maybe a little bit uh, toward the end when we talk about some further considerations. You can save it as video, and, um, and it'll make a much smaller file, uh, MP4 or something, or a Windows Media file. Any other questions at this point? We can move on and look at transitions. And uh, if questions do come up, Vicki, maybe you could just flag me. As, as I said, all I'm seeing is my screen here. All right. I will interrupt. To, um so far, we have a comment from Paul that it's a great presentation and has lots of great tips. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Paul. So slide transitions are, uh, they're not, they're, I consider them animations because they do animate the slideshow. They're not on the animations menu. They have their own tab on the toolbar, as you saw earlier. And there are a bunch of different things you can do. Um, I didn't prepare a whole lot of information on these, uh, but but I'll talk about fades, and then we'll briefly touch on wipes and different kinds of things. I do want to look at 
two special ones that I like a lot. One is called dynamic content, and the other is that wonderful morph effect that you saw at the beginning of the presentation. So as with animation, um, you know, before you go too crazy with transitions, you, you want to consider the situation, of course. Think about who your audience is and what mood and message you want to affect and send. Because you can, you can do that. And you can, you can actually affect the mood and the message of a transition somewhat with timing adjustments and effect options. So you know, start, with a, start with the defaults, see how it looks. Most of the time, for me, those defaults are pretty abrupt. And I like to stretch things out a little bit um, or just make them different. I talked about fade and fade to black, which you've seen a lot of today. Um, until recently, PowerPoint also offered fade to white in the effect options. But I don't see that there anymore. I don't know what's up with that. But, but it's easy to build a fade to white effect manually. And this will be a good example for, for building anything. Um, so let's take a look. We'll go through this step by step. And I'll tell you how I would, how I would do this. So I want to fade to white between slides 95 and 96 here, between the green slide and the black slide. Um, and I think I shot myself in the foot when I put this together. I don't think it's going to end up with a black slide at the end. But bear with me. Um, so you'll, you'll right click on the, on the first slide, on slide 95, and you'll get this little drop down menu. And you can select New Slide. If your background, if your slide background of that slide is set to white, you'll get a new slide with a white background. If it's not, you can right click on that slide. And you'll get a little dialog that lets you format the background, among other things. And you can set it to white or any color that you want. Then, um, sorry, I'm finding my place in my notes here. Now you assign a fade transition to the white slide and another fade transition to the following slide, which would be the black slide. You can select both these slides at once in the left-hand bar um, by pressing Shift or Control and clicking the second one. Um, while the first one's selected, and then, uh, or, or you can do it individually. But then, select fade, and then in effect options, select smoothly, which I think is selected by default. Although, unless the previous, if the previous slide had a fade to black transition, then that will transfer to this, uh, may transfer to this new slide as well. So make sure it's, it says smoothly. Then you set the white slide to advance automatically. I've set it to two seconds here. I think the default is zero, so you'll want to add some time. But now here's something that can be frustrating, and it was frustrating for me for a long time until I got used to it. The transition you select in the, in the is the entrance transition for the slide on the screen. Let me go back here to where we selected the transition. Oh, it doesn't show it. But, um, but it'll tell you up here in the, uh, in the title bar, it's a trans it says transition to this slide. So this fade is going to happen when you come to the slide that's affected, OK? From the slide before it to the slide that's highlighted on the screen. But when you go over to Advanced Slide, even though the same slide is selected, this operates on the other end. This is how the slide exits. So you've got to flip back and forth. If you, it, it, it seems like this is connected to the transition, but it's actually connected to the transition of the next slide. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, you'll, you'll see what I mean as soon as you try to do this. Um, I don't know how many times I set the, the timing on the wrong transition because, because I didn't do the flip-flop deal there. So when you adjust timing, 
in the timing toolbar that affects the way the current slide exits. When you set the transition, that affects the way the current slide enters. So, so let's see. With the white side, with white slide selected, I set the timing uh, for the fade up to the next slide. Um, let's see. Oh, let me go back. Sorry, next up here. Um, oh, the other things here in the toolbar duration. The, the duration is how long the uh, the transition takes, right? So you can make it fade very slowly if you want to. That can be helpful sometimes. You can make it happen real quick. And that just depends on how you're talking and the message and everything. So after you get all these timings set, this is what a fade to white would look like. That was with a two-second deal, right? a, a two-second exposure on the white slide. Okay? And of course, you can fade through any color too, by setting the background of that white slide to something different. Fade to purple if you want to, which um, in this case was kind of ugly, but you know, there's a place for everything. Right? Oh, before we get into dynamic content, I wanted to talk about um, the other kinds of effects. I don't have a slide for it. There's all kinds of different things. Um, see if I can get here. You know, there's lots of different uh, different wipes and special crazy stuff. Um, there's things that turn pages and flip. You saw the airplane before. Um, again, my recommendation is to, to use those uh, sparingly. They can be very effective if you don't see them very often. If you see them a lot, they'll start to drive you crazy. But, um, but you can really use them. If you want to show, say, a, a series of paintings, there's a thing called gallery where it's like you're walking past things in a gallery. Um, so there's a lot of different stuff. And they all have different options, and you can adjust the heck out of them. So dig into those a little bit and see what you like. Um, there's often something that you'll find that will work just perfect for your situation that might look hideous anywhere else. So I'm not going to talk about any of those in detail. But I do want to talk about dynamic content. And I apologize for having to dance all over the place here. Dynamic content is, I think this came out in um, PowerPoint 2013. And it allows you to, to set a background on a series of slides and then change the objects on the slide and set a, a really dynamic uh, transition, which will only change, only act on the objects on the slide, not on the background, which is a cool thing. Um, the objects change, the background does not, and this is what it looks like. I've got two slides here, two sets of data, and these are going to look pretty much the same. But you'll see these are numbered 1 through 6, these bars. The second slide is numbered 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And I can set up a pan effect where it starts on the first slide and then pans to the second slide as if they're all one thing. I think the opportunity here is tremendous. And it works back and forth. So if you need to talk about a whole bunch of data or a whole bunch of uh, anything, who knows what? You, know, you can shift back and forth, and, and it's all connected. You can also use this vertically with a spreadsheet, for example, where you can scroll from, you know, if you've got too much data to show in one, too many rows to show in one screen, you can scroll down to the rest of it. And again, back and forth. And you don't have to click this with the mouse either. You can use the back and forth or the left and right arrows on the keyboard to just go back and forth and talk about these things. You can, and it depends on how you set up your slide. In the middle of this apparently seamless thing is a break between the two slides. So it, it takes some, you know, you have to set them up so that, they're, so that they align with each other and they're the same size and all of that. You, um, there is a zoom effect, James, um, that is limited. 
what I'll often do is um, is actually take another picture of the data, and uh, it, it's hard to zoom in on a certain spot on the screen. There's a zoom effect in PowerPoint that'll just zoom into the center of whatever you're showing. This is one reason I like um, Keynote on the Mac better, because you can you've got a selective zoom. You can go to a certain place on the slide and really blow that up. Um, but I'll, sometimes I'll take a picture of, the, of a, a section of this data, and then uh, you can use the morph effect, which we're going to see in a minute, to zoom into that. And it appears as a, a, uh, a smooth zoom. So this is dynamic content. The key, again, and maybe this wasn't a good, you can see it better on the previous slide, but the background here, which contains this headline, transition dynamic content. You see, it doesn't change. With old, older kinds of animations, that would scroll as well, and it would show up again on the next slide. But here, it doesn't do that. Lots and lots of possibility to work with this. Oh, that was morphs that just disappeared. Um, the morph thing is uh, is a kind of a brand new one, and this is with PowerPoint 2016. And I think the catch is you have to have a subscription to Office 365, or else you don't have access to Morph, which is kind of a dirty trick. But you can't blame Microsoft for wanting to make some money on subscriptions. Here's how it works. Let's say you've got two sets of data. Um, you can make a slide of the first set, and then you make a slide of the second set where you change the numbers to show what happened the next year. Okay, When you apply a morph transition between these two, it does that. Makes the transition smooth. And again, it works in both directions. So this is a way that maybe you could use, um, James, you could you could use a zoom thing to uh, zoom into a certain part of a spreadsheet. Of course, you'd have to know ahead of time what you wanted to look at in detail and, and set it up that way. So that's Morph. And there's, um, do I have another sample of Morph? I don't think so. Uh, to me, the sky's the limit. I mean, you know, your imagination is the only thing holding you back from taking over the world with this. That's my opinion. <laughs> so, some further considerations, though. Um, these things work best in real time. We're looking, I'm running PowerPoint right now on my computer. If you these may disappoint in streaming applications. For example, Adobe Connect strips the transitions out of a PowerPoint presentation, um, probably because they uh, use up so much memory. They're, they're so big. And so if you want to see them, you have to do it a different way. You can't upload the slideshow into Adobe Connect. You have to do it perhaps like I'm doing it. Um, where I'm sharing my screen and you're actually watching the slideshow on my screen. You might consider also converting the thing to video. Um, and, and this can be good if you want to post it on a on slideshare or Vimeo or something. You, it's, if you post a video, then you'll see all those transitions. And your, um, you know, your soundtrack will be aligned and everything. So that's something to look into. And finally, the overall effect of any uh, animation or transition really depends on the content that you to which you apply it. You can take a really radical animation, well, as radical as PowerPoint gets. And if you apply it to something small on the screen, it has a completely different effect than if you apply it to the entire slide. So play with things like that. 
you can also apply something like a like a wipe um, between two slides. And if you only change one thing on the slide, the wipe effect will only appear to work on that one thing, like a line of text. So that's another um, little place where you can be flexible. And one more point I want to let you know about is that baconipsum.com is a real website. I think it's a great alternative for uh, boilerplate text. If you're tired of lorem ipsum, ipsum, you can get a meat theme thing to end paste here, says James, you right, sir? So that's all I have for today. Um, unless people have questions, we've got a little bit of time left. Um, but this is how to contact me. And you, your questions may not come up till later. Please uh, be in touch if you want to. And oh, can you see information about my system's battery performance? Yes, my we can. Laptop, my laptop needs a new battery. Thanks, Tashima. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, so I, I plan. Of, sorry, go ahead. So a couple of people are typing questions. Um, okay. I'll say in the, in the meantime that, um, that I plan to make a couple of little videos about this thing, and I'll, and I'll post links to those on Twitter. Sounds good. And if you, yeah, if you uh, send me the links, I'll also make sure that everybody that um, is on the attendees or signed up for this will get that in their email. Great. So, Robert, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. So the animation that made the fly crawl across the screen and then get bigger and then have the frog eat it, what did you use for those? How that many was slides almost, was that? Oh, that was like eight or ten slides, and it was a series of morphs. So what I did... Let's see if I can go back and, uh, and break those down. Let's see, where was that thing? Not oh, here. It was relatively Sorry, early, I, right? I moved it. I Originally, it was at the very beginning, and now it's not. So that's why I don't know where it is. There we go. There it is. So the first slide, I don't know if you can see here on my screen with the uh, with this toolbar on the front. But the fly is down here waiting in the wings on the first slide. You can see his little eyeball and his little legs sticking up. And the next slide, I've just moved him up onto the screen. The transition to this slide is morphed, OK? And it's set to two minutes, or two seconds, I mean. And so within two seconds, the fly crawls up. That's what Morph does for you. It just smoothly transitions from one to the next. And the next slide, I've turned the fly. So he goes like that. And that, that one's a lot faster. That takes a quarter of a second, as you'll see over here in the duration on the right-hand side. And the next slide, it moves across the screen. And then, I think I just, um, in Photoshop or something, I just made the fly bigger and, and morphed to that. So these are all morph transitions. And, um, and when you run them smoothly, It's just a, kind of a seamless thing. And then the frog appears. And uh, this is a series of slides. First the frog, and then his mouth opens. And then his tongue comes out. And then the fly is captured, and the frog is happy. So that was just one morph after another. 
Yeah, it's great to see it broken down, though, slide by slide. It just really made it so much clearer. I mean, it's still fancy and looks magical, but when you show it, it I feel like maybe even I could do something like that. I should have put that. Um, I should have put all those at the end there. That would have been a good demonstration. But thank you for uh, for asking me about that. And that took a really long time, as you could imagine. But um, as I said, one of the things I love about this stuff is that it's fun, and uh, and so it's a labor of love, and it's not that hard when you like what you're doing, right? That's the ticket. Do we have other questions? So there's some more people typing. Um, Krista says, that was really cool. <laughs> Thank you, Krista. Mm -hmm. And Krista says, Thank you. And most of the stuff that I showed you, with the exception of morph, will work in uh, previous uh, versions of PowerPoint as well. As I said, morph is a 2016 PowerPoint 2016 deal. But um, but all these other things are updated as well in my copy of uh, PowerPoint 2013. Is that what it is? So Microsoft has been has still been maintaining that program and, and updating that. Break down the one where oh the letters the, the STC thing at the beginning. I could I could only see part of the text box. Okay, Paula. Okay, so let me here. let me read. Hang on uh, just a sec, because uh, Chris, yes, Chris had a comment. Says uh, Chris had a comment. Uh, says very cool. Um, been learning Storyline too, and it's nice to know that I might be uh, might be able to do similar things with a program that most people even have access to. So, which is yes. great because uh, PowerPoint is um, a lot of people do have PowerPoint as opposed to Storyline. That's a good point. And so that now Paula point. says, <laughs> Paula says, could you break down the one where the letters reordered themselves? Yes, thank you. And yes, Chris, the PowerPoint is, is ubiquitous. And so it's neat that, that it's getting sophisticated enough that we can do really interesting and fun things with it. And because you can whip together a, a little training session or, or a, a you know, information transfer presentation in a pretty short time. And, um, and it doesn't look like a doofus, stupid mess like PowerPoint used to unless you give it the stupid doofus approach, which I'm trying to talk you out of here. So here's where I started, instructional design and learning. Actually, in this slide, we have a whole bunch of different uh, objects, and these are all grouped together. So I will ungroup them. You know about that? Try to ungroup them. Um, Maybe they're not grouped. Maybe I grouped them later. I think I did. I grouped them later, and I, I made the capital letters of each word into separate objects. That's what I did. And I placed them above these letters, and then I faded to this slide where only the capital letters up here. So this was just a fade from that to that. Then I made a duplicate of this slide, and I moved all those letters around, and I moved the, uh, the STC logo up. And all you have to do for that is drag and drop. But then you apply the morph effect. And instead of a laborious thing, it just does the smooth, beautiful transition, just like that. So it's very simple. And you could do this manually, of course, but it would probably take an hour at least. And it would drive you crazy, and you'd have to draw guidelines to get them all lined up. I guess I probably had to do that anyway. But Morph uh, 
just makes it all smooth. And you don't have to worry about timings and all that nonsense as you would if you did it manually. Whoops, I'm in the wrong place here. And there it is. Okay. You're welcome. Anything else? Well, if you do have anything else, please get in touch. I'll be happy to talk about this stuff with you because um, I really love it. Shoot me an email or uh, start up a chat on the IDL SIG. Okay, it's printed out. On the IDLC discussion board. And uh, thank you all for attending. Okay, well, people are typing their thanks into the chat box, and I think it's time for all of us to do applause from the menu. Give <laughs> Robert a big, loud, loud uh, thundering round of applause. This was really, really fascinating, and I learned so much. And now I have an excuse to upgrade to 2016, right? Yeah, you really do. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. OK, and for everyone who's attending, I'm going to stop the recording in just a second. And then if you have a question you didn't want to ask on the recording, you can feel free to ask it. So here we go. I'm